I'm so excited to talk to you today about um, this really remarkable person. His name is Noble Johnson, and he was once one of the most recognizable black men in America, perhaps even in the entire world. During his four decade career on screen, he appeared in over 200 productions, um, appearing alongside the likes of Rudolph Valentino, Anna Mae Wong, uh, Clarence Muse, Buster Keaton, Greta Garbo, Nina Mae McKinney, uh, John Wayne, the, the list goes on. In 1916, Noble Johnson founded the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, one of the most successful early black film companies in the United States. And in doing so, he arguably became the first black movie star and certainly the first black matinee idol. Yet despite all of these achievements, Noble's legacy and his incredible life has long been shrouded in mystery. The story of his rise, his, his accomplishments, and his eventual disappearance is the story that I want to share with you today. Noble Johnson was born in 1881 to a black father and to a mother of unclear racial identity. He spent the, the early part of his life homesteading. He worked as a cowboy, though you wouldn't know it for most Hollywood films. Nearly a quarter of the cowboys in the American West were African American. In 1915, uh, he moved to Los Angeles and he began working at Universal City, uh, where his relatively light complexion and his really tremendous skills as a makeup artist enabled him to play a variety of different racial types on screen. In fact, he was so good at it that he secured one of the most coveted positions at Universal as one of the studio's contract actors. At six foot two, with a stature as regal as his name, he captivated his audiences with this exceptional ability to embody his character's warring traits. Yet he wasn't satisfied just playing a role in someone else's story. He wanted to write and to produce films of his own. And he realized that dream in 1916 when he co-founded the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. The Lincoln produced race films. So they basically featured black casts and were exhibited primarily to black audiences. And it really revolutionized uh, filmmaking in the US. Noble was the company's president and he also wrote and he acted in its productions. It's a few of his different films. This is the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. And this clip here is the only surviving footage of Noble in a race film. Last year I identified this footage once considered lost uh, from the Trooper of Troop K, the Lincoln's second and most popular film. Uh, with the help of my colleague, Allison Field, who's here, and Mike Michon at the Library of Congress. As far as we know, this is the earliest known surviving footage from a black produced film in American history. I think it's a really vivid illustration of the creativity and the innovation of early African American filmmakers. Uh, you saw that neat kind of special effect up in the uh, corner there, the iris shot where you see Noble flash on screen for just a second. And even though we only see him for a moment, I think it really shows what drew audiences to him. And I also really love the performance of Beulah Hall, who's the actress here, especially when her face kind of turns stormy with, uh, with jealousy and then she pulls herself together. We're really lucky to have this footage. Uh, most of Noble's personal records have been lost. Around the time that he retired from the screen, he basically stopped using the name Noble Johnson pretty much altogether, and he spent his final years in obscurity. Shortly before his death, he reportedly either lost or destroyed most of the remaining records of his remarkable career. So why would somebody who had once invested so much in telling stories of black life on screen work so diligently to prevent his own story from being told? What compelled him to obscure the facts of his hard-won achievements? The truth is, his own efforts um, to hide his past were only part of the story. This chapter of his life begins uh, when he was still at Universal and at the same time uh, working as um, the, the president of the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. 
a few white theaters uh, had noticed that their um, rival black theaters were putting up these posters with Noble's image on them and depicting him as the star of the productions. They contacted Universal and uh, Universal uh, reportedly gave him an ultimatum. It's either us or it's the Lincoln. You can see here, um, this is a Universal serial. Uh, this image here is uh, from Universal and you can see the star is James Corbett. This is from a black newspaper. <laughs> you can tell there's somebody missing uh, from that ad. <laughs> kind of like the inverse of something like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> Since Noble relied on Universal for his income, he quit the company that he had co-founded and subsequently changed his legal name to Mark Noble. He also asked the Lincoln to refrain from referring to his um, career and his daily life in their publicity materials. He also stopped talking directly with the press about pretty much anything, but especially anything that had to do with his race. Now, there was a lot going on that contributed to these developments. Um, first, there's the matter of the Hollywood Production Code, right? that set of rules by which Hollywood regulated its own productions. There were a lot of suggestions, but a few really hard and fast rules, and one of those rules had to do with miscegenation. But Hollywood didn't just interpret um, the idea of miscegenation in you know, the kind of traditional way of just interracial, sexual, or romantic relationships. Um, as the actress Nina Horn recalled, the studios interpret the rule to mean any kind of social equality, right? And by that, she explains, it could be two friends standing together in conversation or seated at a table together or attending the same school or working together side by side. Then there's the matter of Noble's wife. He was married to a woman who was 18 years older than him, very unusual at the time. Um, but the real issue was the fact that she was white. And in California, marriages between black and white couples were illegal under the state's anti-miscegenation laws. There we see that word again. In fact, these laws were strengthened in 1943 when the state stipulated that anyone defy defying its statute uh, would receive a fine up to $10,000 or 10 years in prison. And with the constant threats of anti-black violence in this country, you know, the consequences uh, could have been much more dire. Finally, there's the matter of where he lived. He'd scraped up enough money to buy um, some property in Glendale, California, and he was saving up to buy a house, probably building it with his own two hands. But as this was happening, Glendale was becoming increasingly white, not just naturally, but because of the concerted efforts of real estate agents, of local white supremacists, and of town boosters. In 1924, for example, a massive Klan rally was held at the estate of community leader Elsie Brand. If you've ever been to Glendale, you've probably driven down Brand Avenue at some point. Uh, in another highly publicized incident, uh, the local paper is reported of a, quote, vengeful mob that was organizing uh, to lynch a man in town named John Allen. Yet just another reminder that segregation and racial violence weren't just limited to the South. So as you can see, these are some very serious circumstances. The more explicit the noble was about his race and about his politics, the more that he put himself at risk. But if his response appears on the surface to be a familiar tale of racial passing as a black person pretending uh, to be white, it wasn't that simple. To be clear, he never denied the fact of his blackness. He just refused to talk about himself and about his race um, uh, publicly. Now, that didn't stop others, however, um, from talking about him. And black newspapers and magazines continued to claim him as their own. Um, they continued to celebrate his successes. And in fact, there's good reason to believe that Noble secretly contributed uh, to these reports and to stories in the black press about the conditions and opportunities for black actors in Hollywood. Now, there's a lot of reasons to believe that this is true, but one of the most compelling uh, is the fact that a lot of these reports, not all of them, but many, were published by this thing called the Pacific Coast News Bureau, or written by this guy named George Perry. Now, if you go to UCLA, 
um, <laughs> check out the archives, you'll see that there's a lot of information about this guy, George Perry, who's actually, uh, his name is George P. Johnson. He's Noble's brother. <laughs> Uh, and a fellow board member, former board member of the Lincoln uh, Company. He started the Pacific Coast News Bureau to specialize uh, in news of the theater and, uh, and of, of Hollywood. Um, a lot of the information in the press releases uh, were, was information that only Noble would have known, like what kind of car he drove off to his uh, latest production, um, what opportunities uh, were open to black actors at the studios where he happened to be working. Casting, of course, was a critical civil rights uh, demand that Hollywood studios cast black actors um, for black parts instead of having white actors play those roles in blackface. Uh, meanwhile, Noble continued to act in Hollywood films, becoming one of the industry's best known character actors and the first black member of the Screen Actors Guild. During these years, he appeared in a compendium of Hollywood classics uh, you might recognize him from some of these films. Thief of Baghdad with Douglas Fairbanks. There he is with John Barrymore. King Kong. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille film. He's in several Cecil B. DeMille films. Uh, she wore a yellow ribbon, um, John Ford. Um, and even from fairly forgettable films like The Ghost Breakers um, uh, with Bob Hope in which Noble's stunning performance as a zombie is frequently cited as the most memorable in the production. Or even here in Joseph Cornell's landmark surrealist film, Rose Hobart, the film that reportedly so enraged uh, Salvador Dali that he like knocked over the 16 millimeter projector and started screaming that the film had been stolen from his dreams. <laughs> <laughs> the inclusion of Noble's image in the picture um, uh, which mostly draws from his film Issa Borneo, is arguably intended to suffuse the film with its impenetrable mystery and desire. By highlighting Noble's achievements, I don't mean to ignore his complicated legacy. Clearly, he appeared in a lot of films that we would find troubling today. We can bracket our conversation about his uh, performance in The Mysterious Dr. Fu Manchu for another time. <laughs> um, the fact is, uh, we often want the people that we admire, whose accomplishments we want to remember, to be uncomplicated. But that's not who Noble was, because that's not how real people are. This is especially important to keep in mind, because he faced circumstances that we can hardly fathom today. Noble was a complicated individual, with his own dreams and desires, his own idiosyncrasies, but I would argue that that is the magic of so many of his performances on screen, that even when presented with the most stereotypical, one-dimensional roles, he brought that complexity to the screen. And even today, when we watch um, film or television, right, we're so often presented um, with what the film scholar Kristen J. Warner has described as plastic representations. Right? From afar, they look OK, but up close, right, they're hollow and empty. When we watch Noble's performances, we see him uh, transform what on the page are so often the flattest, most plastic roles into something else, into performances in which this complex sense of humanity always bursts forth, as captivating today as it was nearly a century ago.